The story began in the era of President Johnson's leadership, the 36th President of America. During that time, America had a war against Vietnam, and to increase the number of soldiers on the battlefield, the government increased the number of conscripts of the citizen from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. The war centralized leadership made some of the well-known critics like Martin Luther Jr. speak up and even caused riots in several states to protest against the war. One day, a meeting of the Students for a Democratic Society or SDS was held. Two men named Tom Hayden and Rennie Davis led the meeting. During the meeting, they planned to protest the National Convention of the Vietnam War in Chicago. They said to the journalists that they would come to the venue no matter what. They also said that they would come in peace. At the same time, the Youth International Jewish Party or Yippies led by Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin were planning the same thing, even though the approach was different. Meanwhile, somewhere else, a man named David Dellinger, the leader of the mobilization to end the war in Vietnam or the MOB was getting ready to leave for a protest with Jerry and Abby. His family worried that he might get arrested during the demonstration. Jerry and Abby were two eccentric activists and David could get into trouble if he joined them. During a press conference, David told the journalists that he would not cause any riot during the protests. Elsewhere, the national chairman of the Black Panther named Bobby Seale was planning a speech against the war. He knew that well what is waiting for him in the end. He knew that things could go wrong for people like him, who vocally expressed their protest against the government. People like Martin Luther Kong, Malcolm X, and Medgar Evers met their death tragically for acting against the government. Consolidation to protest the government was held. Tom and Rennie told Ebby and Jerry by phone about it. Somehow, the government had predicted the protest and prepared thousands of soldiers and police to guard Chicago. The buzzers described that Tom and the other activists were making a movement to get rid of the government. Five months after the conference and protests, President Johnson had been replaced by Nixon. One day, the federal prosecutors named Richard Schultz and his senior, Thomas Foran, arrived in Washington, D.C. to meet the new attorney general, John Mitchell to discuss the protest that happened five months ago. According to the Attorney General, the activists who deliberately initiated the protest which were Tom, Rennie, Abby, Jerry, and David, plus two other names, Lee Weiner and John Froines, who conspired the hate speech, and Bobby Seale, who was considered dangerous by the government for his link to the Black Panther, the fact that he is a black American, and his connection to the alleged police officer murder case, were all considered rebellious by the government and would be charged with ten. Years in prison, Richard was assigned to lead the case but he objected to the reason that the law used was actually made for black people, but the attorney general insisted. He argued that the law would affect the same, no matter who the subject is. Richard said that the indictment made it look like the government was trying to limit people's freedom of speech. Moreover, they need to find out the initiator of the riots in the protests. The attorney general thought that the only important thing was for Richard to win the trial since he was assigned to it. Long story short, the trial finally started. Outside of the courthouse, hundreds of protesters took action against the accusation of treason against the Chicago 7, the designation for Tom and his fellow activists. They were represented by William Kunstler and Leonard Wineglass as their lawyer, while Bobby was represented by Charles who happened to be at the hospital. In front of the journalists, William said that he was not speaking on behalf of Bobby and so, Fred Hampton, the chairman of the Illinois chapter Black Panther. Lee Weiner and John Froines were also there. Inside the courtroom, Fred asked William to represent Bobby as well but he refused due to the different case that Bobby was facing. That trial was led by Judge Julius Hoffman. The first day of the trial finally started with the opening statement by the main prosecutor, Richard, who explained to the jury that the eight defendants represented three different parties. During the trial, Abby often disrupted the trial by speaking out of his time, while Bobby kept telling the judge that he was not supposed to be in that trial, but the judge didn't care, especially since Bobby was a suspect for the alleged murder of a policeman in Connecticut. Richard told the jury that even though all the activists came from different parties, they all had one similar goal, to bring violence to the streets. After the opening statement by Richard, Bobby cut off the judge by saying that he should have attended the trial with Charles's lawyer, but instead, he was not there due to his health condition. Judge Julius then ordered William to represent Bobby as well because they were on the same case in the trial, but William reasoned that he didn't want to endanger Bobby's position because he was indicted for murder. Bobby defended himself by saying that the only thing he did was convey a speech without any intention to murder someone. Judge Julius went angry and told him to stop disrupting the trial. Get your hands off me. During the break, William took all the defendants to a room to discuss their strategy and approach. They realized that Judge Julius might bias his decision to a personal matter. 
They had to prove that they had no intention to incite hate speech in society. Tom told Abby and Jerry to behave during the trial to avert bad judgment to them. They had to direct the judge's attention to the protest itself, not to themselves, to make sure that Judge Julius and the juries would understand that their purpose wasn't mere violence, but to denounce the war and that they were against the war itself. In the middle of the discussion, Fred came and accused William of discrimination for not defending Bobby in front of the judge, but William insisted that Bobby's case was different from the other defendants because he was accused of murder. William also said to remain professional, especially for Abby and Jerry. Proceeds to the third trial session. Richard called David Stahl, a government administration official, to be present in the trial as a witness. He was the person in charge to permit a public event. Richard knew that David Stahl had been visited by Jerry and Abby when they arranged the protest action. Somehow, Jerry and Abby also included a rock music concert and even an orgy. The conditions were immediately refused but Jerry and Abby threatened him, saying that there would be 10,000 people coming to the protest no matter what. They even sued him for $100,000 if he still wanted to cancel the event. Trial day 4 was held the next day. Leonard started the trial by asking some questions to him. Leonard asked if other people visited besides Jerry and Abby and apparently, Tom, Rennie, and even David Dellinger met him to ask for permission for the protest action in the park, at the same time when the government had a conference. David Dellinger convinced him that the action would be peaceful. Leonard asked the reason behind every refusal he did to Tom. David Stahl explained that despite the permission, people would still come to protest, and if there were no place for them to do the demonstration, they would do their thing in any place they could find and riots would be all over Chicago. Tom said that things might be dangerous, but David Stahl didn't budge. William then asked about the $100,000 sue from Jerry and Abby and why he didn't report it to the FBI, federal attorney, district attorney, or even police. He also mentioned the threat that David Stahl received from the activists and the damage to the public, but David instead refuted that all damages were none caused by the police. After returning from the trial, William reminded them not to hold any more press conferences because any mistakes they did would be used against them in the trial. At that time, TM and Rennie realized that juries number 6 and 11 were supporting them, judging from their behavior during David Stahl's testimony. Long story short, they finally underwent trial day 23. Before the trial started, Judge Julius spoke to a police officer. He then informed that the trial was adjourned and summoned the lawyers and prosecutors. He informed them that apparently, jurors number 6 and 11 were threatened by Black Panther and he had to dismiss them from their duty. William thought that there was a conspiracy to defeat them in the court. Judge Julius also mentioned that the jurors' families were under threat so their judgment might be impartial and biased. The decision was detrimental to the activists but they couldn't do anything about it. William realized that the threat was not from the Black Panther and suspected that the federal prosecutor was behind the threat. The activists later discussed jurors that would replace jurors numbers 6 and 11. They knew that either way, the trial was detrimental to them. Abby was annoyed when he realized political involvement in the trial. Suddenly, they found out that jurors number 6 and 11 were exiled to save them from the threats. That would delay the investigation of the threat letter. The trial continued. When William was presenting the vote of refusal of jurors number 6 and 11's isolation, he was cut by Judge Julius. Judge Julius ordered Jerry and Abby, who were using the judge's robe, to take them off. Unexpectedly they were using police uniforms with pig written as a name tag on their chest. Judge Julius indicted them for insulting the judge. William was no different. He was indicted for requesting jurors number 6 and 11's isolation which was considered insulting to the trial. The next trial was held by presenting Detective DeLuca to the trial as a witness. He said that he was assigned to supervise Rennie during the protest. Paul testified that one night, before the convention, he saw Tom deflate a police car tire. That night, while gathering at the park, Rennie realized that a police car was following him all day and apparently, was parking there. Tom asked him to get back to the crowd so that DeLuca would still be able to keep an eye on him while Tom would deflate the police car's tire. So that's your car? Yep. Right, hands behind your head. Unfortunately, before he was finished with his stuff, the police saw him and later arrested him for a day. He ordered his friends to stay away but DeLuca testified that Tom instead told them to charge. When the trial was adjourned, Bobby spoke in front of the judge to submit a vote but in the end, he was rejected by Judge Julius. The judge's decision made William angry and couldn't hold his anger any longer. At the next trial, Richard presented the member of the police undercover who infiltrated Abby and Tom's party, including an FBI agent named Daphne. 
he became close friends with Jerry and was presented at the court as a witness. Flashback to five months ago when the protest was held when Tom was arrested, Jerry and Abby led the protest to walk to the police station. They demanded Tom Hayden's discharge. When they arrived, police were already guarding the place with full arms. Jerry suggested they charge the police but Abby was against it. David Dellinger and Daphne also told him to lead the protesters back to the park while she and David would go there to ensure that Tom could get out of there safely. Hearing that, they decided to retreat to the park. When they arrived at the park, there were three divisions of police guarding the park. They told the protesters to retreat because they didn't have permission for a demonstration. Hearing that triggered the mass but Daphne immediately told Jerry to calm the mass down, but suddenly, someone from the crowd yelled to charge the police to conquer the park. Chaos started and tear gases were fired toward them. Many were injured. In the meantime, after successfully guaranteeing Tom's discharge, Abby, Tom, and David returned to the park. Tom was shocked to see the condition in the park. He ordered them to calm the mass down. Abby still wanted to continue the demonstration at the convention, but judging from the condition there, it would be impossible for them to continue. We have to protest in front of the convention. Can you tell me how you do it? This is what happened when we try to go up a hill. Get to the convention. That means we have to leave the park. We're not getting anywhere near the convention. Daphne's testimony helped the Chicago 7 in the trial. Booby stuck to his stance, saying that he was not there. Fred who sit behind him then supported his statement by shouting that Bobby was not in the protest and that he stayed four hours in Chicago just to convey his speech. Everyone applauded hearing the statement. Judge Julius then adjourned the trial until the next week. One day, in front of the museum, Jerry and Abby met with Richard. They didn't know that they used Daphne to infiltrate their party. Richard said that it was the FBI's job to gather information. Jerry said that it was unethical but Richard said that it was only natural for the FBI to do that to keep everything under control. One night, at William's office, he got a phone call informing bad news. Tom and William were required to go to the prison to meet Bobby. Apparently, there was a shootout between the police and Fred Hampton was shot dead at the scene. Turned out, Bobby already knew about it and suspected that it was not a defensive act by the police but an execution. According to Bobby, Fred was first shot in the arm to prevent him from aiming his gun. After that, he was shot in the head to finish him off. Long story short, the 89th trial day was finally held. During the trial, a detective was presented as a witness. They discussed Bobby's speech when he was in Chicago. The detective had a note with him containing some sentences from Bobby's speech that had been changed to make it sound hyperbolic. That made Bobby annoyed and demanded to refute the testimony but Judge Julius didn't let him speak up without a lawyer. He was forced to keep quiet despite the lies that were presented in front of him. He was so annoyed by Judge Julius that he suddenly yelled that Fred was killed last night. Fred Hampton was assassinated last night Marsh. by the bullet wound in his shoulder. The judge told the guards to take him from the courtroom where he ended up beaten in the other room. Rini then sent a message to his fellow activists not to stand to honor Judge Julius. When Bobby returned to the courtroom, he was battered, handcuffed, and his mouth was gagged with a ball of cloth. That sight made everyone shocked and silent. To continue the trial, Judge Julius asked Richard to present the next witness, but before that, Richard requested to approach the judge and was given the chance. Turned out, Richard was against the treatment given to Bobby. Richard's request as a federal prosecutor was then approved. Judge Julius issued a revocation for Bobby's trial and adjourned it. What do you want? You want me to give him his mistrial? When everyone stood up to honor the judge, none of the activists willed to do so, except for Tom who did that on reflex. That night, the Chicago 7 held a meeting. Tom said that they might get arrested and given a verdict since it was a trial, but Abby argued that they were not in the trial because they were arrested, but because they were chosen. They became the scapegoat of the government's political moves. Rennie instead said that this might be an act of revenge from John Mitchell, the former attorney general during President Johnson's leadership, to Ramsey Clark, for the conflict between them that happened during Ramsey Clark's resignation. That statement from Rennie made Leonard and William realize that they hadn't presented Ramsey Clark as their witness. Ramsey Clark's testimony would be a good defense for them in the trial. One noon, William, Leonard, and Tom went to Ramsey's house. When they got there, they saw two senior deputies from the Department of Justice named Mr. Kelly and Mr. Ackerman. Even though both of the senior deputies were still there, Ramsey still gave William the chance to ask a question. 
William knew for sure that both of them would immediately call Richard or even John Mitchell. Despite that, William still conveyed his question to Ramsey. He asked Ramsey if there was any discussion with the White House regarding Tom and the other Chicago 7 members trial. Suddenly, Mr. Ackerman said that Ramsey Clark didn't have the right to answer that question because that was against the law, and even though Ramsey was a former attorney general, he still has to obey the rule. William then asked Ramsey to attend the trial as their witness. Ramsey replied that he would be their key witness and would attend the trial for sure. Hearing that, both the deputy seniors were annoyed. At the next trial, Richard refused to present the attorney general as a witness since it was against federal regulation, but Leonard countered his refusal by saying that the regulation didn't prohibit a former attorney general. Judge Julius approved the regulation and finally let Ramsey be presented as a witness and let William ask questions in voir dire, which means that Ramsey could testify without jurors being presented in the courtroom. William agreed to the conditions and Ramsey was presented to the courtroom. Ramsey testified that President Johnson actually called Ramsey as the Attorney General to file a charge against Tom and the other Chicago 7 members but was later refused by Ramsey because according to the investigation by criminal division working under him, the riot during the protest was triggered by the police who were supposed to guard the demonstration. An investigation by our criminal division that the riots were started by the Chicago Police Department. He also testified that none of the defendants were initiating any kind of violence, but since President Nixon was elected, and John Mitchell was assigned as the new Attorney General, things turned 180 degrees. Richard objected to the testimony and reasoned it to be biased since Ramsey and John Mitchell never liked each other and thus, the testimony would be a political attack on John Mitchell and would be inappropriate in the trial. Judge Julius then signaled that the testimony was in voir dire which means that no jurors would hear this. Ramsey finished his testimony and was about to leave the room, but before that, he told William to ask for an appeal. Before returning to his seat, William asked Judge Julius if they would inform the jurors about the testimony of the former Attorney General, but Judge Julius immediately refused the idea. David who was annoyed by the judge yelled and even called Judge Julius a criminal for not presenting any of the Chicago 7 as a witness in the trial. The atmosphere got tenser after the judge told the guard to arrest and lock David. That made Tom and the others nervous since they didn't have any idea what to do next. Jerry asked Tom about his plan to testify in the trial. Tom said that he had planned to do so, but he thought it would be better if Abby was the one testifying in the trial. Tom said that since the beginning, Tom was against Abby and Jerry. For him, their protest was way too vocal and they behave against the rules. Abby defended himself by saying that he did all that to draw attention to them. The statement between them initiated an argument. Tom said that they all would be imprisoned and Abby responded by saying that they would be imprisoned not because of their actions, but because of who they are. I was one. Paul Bear is you f***ing asshole! That's right! Pro-revolution! Shortly after the argument calmed, William and Leonard came. They brought evidence for them. It was a recording of Tom's voice who started the riot in Chicago. They listened to it. Tom was shocked to hear that. William said that apparently, someone nearby the stage had a voice recorder and had recorded Tom's words. The problem was that the recording would be played in the trial. Tom had to step forward as a witness, or else, it would be checkmate for all of them. That night, when David was giving a speech, someone was climbing a flagpole near the stage. Turned out he was a kid. Their action attracted so many people, including that kid. A policeman then came and ordered that kid to climb down while forcing him by pulling his leg. Suddenly, Rennie came to calm the situation down but the police instead hit his head. David then told Tom to calm the situation down but instead of doing so, Tom yelled to the mass the real situation, saying that Rennie was just hit by the police and initiating the anger of the mass. Tom also said that if they had to draw blood, let the blood flow all over the city. Tom led the mass to the convention but suddenly, the police guarding the protest confronted them and immediately threw tear gas and punches. Those who managed to get out of the park were directed to the bridge but somehow, all accesses to the convention were closed, and moreover, the National Guards were already there, waiting for the Protestants with their heavy armored vehicles. David then ordered the crowd to retreat. Tom, Abby, Jerry, and several other people finally found access to the convention that was not guarded, but when they almost reached the convention, they were confronted by some police. At that very moment, the thing they remembered clearly was that the police had taken off their badges and name tags. They acted brutally against Tom and the others, causing injuries to them. William then simulated if somehow Tom was presented with questions regarding the evidence. William repeatedly gave questions that Tom had to answer as if he was in a real situation. William also asked who started the riot and Tom answered our blood. 
Abby realized that the answer was genius. From the recording, when Tom said if our blood will flow, let it flow all over the city, it means that if they had to be beaten, everyone had to see it to prove that they didn't initiate the riot, but the police. After the simulation, Tom asked Abby to testify in the next trial, and so, he did it. Abby said that the purpose of their protest in Chicago was to convey an idea, but the officers treat them brutally. They were beaten, thrown with tear gas, and even got arrested. He said that long ago, President Lincoln had said that when the people demonstrated their constitutional right to change the government, they would use their revolutionary right to tear apart and overthrow that government. Abby said that if President Lincoln gave a speech at the park with them at that time, he might end up here as well. When it was Richard's turn to ask about the recording of Tom Hayden's words, Abby said that Tom is a brave American patriot Tom who sees his friend's head busted by the police. Richard asked if Abby hated the government, but he replied his hatred towards the government was not even close to their hatred towards him. American democratic institutions were great but were now filled with terrible people. After his testimony, the trial ended. On the 151st trial day, Tom, Rennie, David, Jerry, and Abby entered the courtroom wearing prisoner clothes. Judge Julius said that the law required that before sentencing the defendants, they were allowed to make a trial statement. At that time, the trial statement from the defendant would be represented by Tom Hayden because according to Judge Julius, Tom was the person who never insulted the trial and showed respect for the court. The judge reminded Tom to make his statement as short as possible, without political content, and straight to the point. Tom then started his statement by reading all 4,752 names of the American soldiers who died during the Vietnam War. Everyone in the courtroom stood in respect for those who died, no matter how Judge Julius tried to stop Tom from reading out all those names, Tom kept going. They did lose the trial, but that last statement let everyone know that they really were against the war. These five men were found guilty and sentenced to five years in prison, but after that, the verdict was overturned on appeal and a new trial was set, but the federal prosecutor refused the retrial of the case. William was charged with 24, contempt of court conduct. In a six-month survey, 78% of attorneys in Chicago stated that Judge Julius Hoffman was not qualified for the trial. Bobby was acquitted of charges of police homicide and eventually became a businessman. He later died in a car crash in 1994. Abby Hoffman became a famous writer but he died by suicide in 1989. Tom Hayden was elected to the legislature in California in 1982. He was elected six times in a row, 